Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming to String Finos seminar series today again. And for our first speaker, we have Damian Bandi Heistig from Utrecht University. He'll tell us about moduli stabilization in asymptotic flux compactifications. Take it away, Damian. Thanks. Um, and first, thanks to James, Mankey, and Lim for the link, for the opportunity to, to speak here today um, and for organizing this whole series. And I'll talk today about some work that I've done in collaboration with my um, PhD supervisor, Thomas, and to other people, Lise and Erik, who are also around here in Utrecht. And what I want to convince you of today is that asymptotic Hortz theory can give you a very good perspective and can be a very good tool um, in studying moduli stabilization in string compactifications. So let me first set the stage a little bit. So we're thinking of Calabiao compactifications of type to B string theory here. And then in the four dimensional effective theories that you get out of this, you get a lot of free massless scalar fields uh, corresponding to the Cater deformations and the complex structure deformation, deformations of these compactification manifolds. Now, there is already a well-described way how to get rid of all these moduli. Namely, you turn on three form fluxes the Ramon Ramon flux F3, the NSNS flux H3, and this gives you a potential for your complex structure moduli and your axial digital. If you want, you can go further and try to stabilize your Cato moduli in this setup by using non perturbative effects, but I won't go into these details. What I will be thinking about is how does the stabilization of these complex structure moduli actually work? And for this, we need to know very well how this scalar potential actually varies over the moduli space. And when we are, say, in the bulk of this moduli space in the interior, then this dependence is very complicated. And you can have like transcendental functions, all kinds of nasty exponentials that you need to deal with. But one of the things that I want you to take away from my talk today is that when we go to the boundary, we can make this behavior very precise. Now, a boundary that has been studied before a lot in the literature and by people in this audience is by going to say the large complex structure point. Um, and we know very well what things look like there because we can use mirror symmetry and trace things in terms of intersection of this. But one of the like um, ideas or thoughts that I want to take you away from today is that maybe physics is even more exciting when I go to other points in the moduli space. And you'll see this in like a couple of minutes. So just as a quick review, what do things actually look like in this 4D effective theory? We have Cato potential, which we can compute by integrating the holomorphic 3-0 form and its complex conjugate. Um, and we can similarly compute the flux superpotential by wedging the three-form flux with the 3-0 form. Um, and then the scalar potential either can be computed using the F term formulation in terms of the F terms dW, then the vacuum corresponds to dW equals to zero, or we compute it using the Hort star and write it as G3 bar wedge star G3 as some kind of norm on G3. Um, and then the vacuum corresponds to the imaginary self dual condition on G3. And now, one of the things that you notice from the supergravity data is that basically everything is determined through this 3-0 form. And to make this a little bit more practical, we can expand this 3-0 form in some three-form basis by integrating the 3-0 form over a set of three cycles. And then the functions that you get out are called the periods by i. And then the question is, how do these periods exactly depend on the moduli? Um, and this is what I'll spend the first time of first part of my talk um, talking about, where I'll explain how you can make the dependence of these periods precise in asymptotic regimes in the moduli space. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about two applications um, where we can use all these structures in the boundary to study moduli stabilization. In the first part, we'll talk about getting small flux superpotentials. And in the second part, we try to cook up some more algorithmic computer approach to moduli stabilization. So first things first, how do we even define a boundary? Well, the most standard way is that you take an intersection of two loci, C1 and C2 equal to zero, 
Um, and then you define like the boundaries as where these coordinates are equal to zero. But for us physicists, it's more useful and more practical to work with these exponentiated covering coordinates e to the two pi y t. Why? Because now circling the boundary corresponds to shifting the c by a phase, which in our new coordinates is simply a shift of this axionic field, x going to x plus one. And at the same time, going to the boundary corresponds to making this field y to be large. And when we circle these boundaries, an additional feature that shows up is that our period vector doesn't just go back to its old value, but it actually goes to some kind of monotony matrix acting on the periods. Now, close to the boundary, we can see all this back from expanding the periods, which was established already a while ago. We can expand our period vector by this first vector, which captures the monotony behavior of the periods. And then the rest is some holomorphic expansion in this coordinate C. Um, and one of the things that will become clear in a bit is that actually when you're not at large complex structure, these exponential terms have to be there. They are in some sense essential. Um, and this will be um, clear in a moment. So why are they essential? Well, the idea is that in physics, we don't just care about this period vector where we can drop the exponential corrections when they're small. But we also need to know the derivative of this period vector. For instance, we need the derivative, uh, for instance, when we take a derivative of the three comma zero form with respect to the moduli space coordinates, so moduli space, not the Clabiao space. So we're staying with a three form, we're not going to a four form. When we take this derivative, we go to a two comma one form. And we can act with the derivative again, and end up with a one comma two, and then a zero comma three form. And now the point is that we should be able to generate the whole three form cohomology this way. But if we then take this boundary expansion of the periods, we already see some kind of interesting structure there. Because either we lower a log monotony matrix from this factor in front, or we act on the exponentials in the holomorphic expansion. And now when you go to something like the Convolt point, there, we actually know that the monotony, the monotony matrix acts trivially on this leading term A0. So the log monotony matrix times this A0 is equal to 0. This means that if you want to make sense of your derivative, d pi at the Conifold point, there needs to be a term A1 in the expansion, and you have some existence condition on exponential corrections. On the other end, you can go to the large complex structure point, and then you get this triple product of log monotony matrices, and you know that for some combination, this should be non-vanishing. And this also makes sense because at the large complex structure point, we know that under using mirror symmetry, we can go to this point and we can ignore the world sheet corrections if we go far enough. But now the interesting thing that turns out to happen is that exponential corrections are essential near every boundary apart from large complex structure. So this means that while you might have your intuition from large complex structure that you only need to care about the polynomial part of your Taylor potential, if you go to another boundary, this does not persist. Um, and this also fits nicely with these two works from last year, where they related these kind of exponential corrections to some kind of higher supersymmetric origin, but then just at the large complex structure point. Um, so now, what is the game you can play? You can try to classify what kind of boundaries can arise, and you can try to reconstruct the periods that correspond to these boundaries. So I won't go into the details of these classifications, but they are kind of based on just using rank properties of the log monotony matrices. So at the one modulus level, there are three boundaries that can arise. There's the class of conifold points, the class of large complex structure points, and the less familiar class of Turing degenerations that can arise. At the two moduli level, there are four classes. Again, we can have large complex structure points, or we can have collisions of conifold um, uh, loci, but we can now also have two new classes at our disposal. Namely, we can either have an intersection between conifold and large complex structure divisors somewhere in the moduli space, um, which have been studied last year recently in the literature, or you can have 
these points that cover, for instance, the, this particular point that played an important role in the engineer, geometrical engineering of cyber grid and theories in Clabiao compactifications. And now the game you can play is you can start from this boundary data, just from the ranks and so on that it specifies for your log monotony matrices. And from this data, reconstruct, re-engineer what your asymptotic periods near these boundaries should look like. And from this data, you cannot, can not only just get the polynomial part, but you can even get these exponential, essential exponential pieces. So let me make this more concrete by looking at an example. And let's look at this class of type two one points. And now I try to make the structure in the periods a little bit clearer by color coding things so that you see that there is actually some structure there. So first of all, we have these polynomial pieces, polynomial factors in T. These are precisely what come from the log monotony transformations by shifting T to T plus one um, by circling the boundary. And then you see that depending on the values that N1 and N2 take, you end up with different members in these classes where if both of them vanish, you get one singularity type, but if some of them are non-vanishing, you get another one. And one of the interesting things that you notice here is that if I even turn on like this first instanton term, um, exponential suppressed term nearest boundary, like e to the two pi i t two, it's not the most generic factor that's written down there, but actually everything boils down to this one coefficient a, which is determined by the underlying geometry. And to be a little bit more precise, you can turn on, you can uh, match with this particular example in the literature by setting n1 equals to zero and two equals to a quarter. And if I remember correctly, a equals to some gamma value. So now, if we take this asymptotic model, what can we learn about effective theory? So we can compute the Kähler potential and study the Kähler metric a little bit. We can nicely separate the polynomial terms in the Kähler potential from the exponentially suppressed term. Um, and then this polynomial part takes this linear form, y1 plus n2, y2. And if we then compute the Kähler metric, we already find something quite interesting. Namely, we get this matrix times some overall factor. And this matrix actually has one eigenvalue with a eigen, eigenvalue going as one over y squared, which corresponds to this eigenvector. But it has another one for which it vanishes. Um, and this is at first a bad sign because, well, you have your kinetic terms for your moduli and having a zero eigenvalue basically means that there's one modulus without the kinetic term, which should not happen. And then this can be cured by including the first set of exponential corrections, uh, which actually give it this exponentially small eigenvalue. And this is why we refer to these exponential corrections as metric essential. Now, another thing that I'd like to point out is, is this boundary at infinite distance or not? If you, and this you can also see here, because this factor n2, one, n2 being positive points towards the singularity, while this n2, minus one kind of points towards it in one direction and away from it in the other. So the only way that you can approach this is by using this first eigenvector, otherwise you're also moving away from it. So you can see that this is a genuine infinite distance divisor singularity provided and two being non-zero from whatever direction you approach the singularity. And at least to me at first, this was kind of surprising because from the conical point, you might expect that exponential corrections are important, but then this is some finite distance singularity. So you think maybe this is something for finite distance, but here we have an infinite distance singularity where exponential corrections are important, which to me was very surprising. So now let's take things and make it a little bit more concrete from the perspective of flux compactifications. Um, and what, what does this actually mean for the scalar potential? Are these metric essential corrections important or not? So similar to the scalar potential, we can split the superpotential into a polynomial and an exponentially suppressed part. And for the moment, let's just be simple and turn on one particular flux such that we only get an exponentially suppressed. And what you then find is that the F term for like this eigenvector with an exponentially small 
eigenvalue um, is exponentially suppressed. Goes as e to the minus two pi y. But if you now compute the scalar potential by using this F term formulation, you actually find this, these exponentials cancel because the inverse scalar metric actually has an exponentially large eigenvalue and the F terms dw each go as e to the minus two pi y. So if you combine all these factors in the end, they cancel out and you're left with something polynomial. So what can we take away from this? Well, it means that if we take the extremization conditions, vanishing F terms, dw equals to zero, it means that we cannot just restrict to the polynomial part if we're interested in the polynomial part of the scalar potential. It means that we have to go further and include these metric essential corrections when we want to stabilize our moduli at the level of the polynomial scalar potential. So before I showed you metric essential instantons, but let me also show you the opposite example where they're not important for the metric. So for this, I wanted to show you briefly this one modulus example um, where if you take two derivatives, while the periods that goes at most are linear in T, you see that these vanish. So for the double and the triple derivatives, you need essential corrections to be there. But when you compute the Kähler potential, which goes as minus log y, and this is sufficient to have a non-degenerate metric. So now let's go to the modular stabilization. And first, let's try to do this using the F terms and see what we can get from this. So maybe to make a remark before, there has been a lot of interest in finding vacua and using exponential skills here. And the reason for this is that in the KKLT scenario, the first step is you want an exponentially small superpotential when you stabilize your convex structure moduli. And you need this later down the line um, when you think about stabilizing your Kähler moduli in a suitable regime. And there, these kind of vectors have received a lot of attention uh, in the last couple of years because there has this been, been this very nice construction, um, which first did it at large complex structure and then extended it to an intersection of a conifold divisor and a large complex structure divisor in a modular space. And how this roughly works is as follows. You use the structure in the intersection numbers and you engineer this one particular path in your moduli space as a perturbatively flat direction. Then by using the instanton corrections that are there, you get some kind of racetrack potential on this modulus and this stabilizes for you this remaining direction and generates for you the exponentially small super potential. Now, the question that we ourselves had as well. We have all these exponential corrections as well, but from a slightly different perspective. Can we use these to generate small superpotentials at other boundaries? So this is what we actually tried in the two examples that I showed you before. Um, and the idea here is we want to stabilize our moduli at the level of this polynomial scalar potential in our coordinates, such that W0 is exponentially small. So starting point, of course, we should impose a dw polynomial equals to zero, and we supplement this by imposing that the polynomial superpotential should vanish as well. And now, I told you before that we need to care about metric essential corrections, but we also set the f terms along these to zero. Um, and the precise way that we did it in our examples is by taking eigenvectors with vanishing eigenvalues of this polynomial Kähler metric and contracting them with the f terms. And from this, you get your conditions very nicely and they just read as some polynomial equation in the moduli. And for the particular example I showed you, it's just this factor m2 comma minus one. Now, naturally, by having that the polynomial superpotential vanishes, the scale of the vacuum superpotential will be set by the essential corrections. So, well, the first box is satisfied. We have an exponentially small superpotential. And you can actually see that for any boundary where this polynomial part of the Kähler potential is at most linear, you can stabilize all your moduli. Uh, and the interesting feature that we noticed for our vacua is that the masses of all the moduli take actually at least a polynomial value, um, which means that they're actually separated in scale from the Kähler moduli in the KKLT scenario. And this is something that's not naturally achieved in these racetrack models that I talked about before where you kind of have to 
three this lightest complex structure modulus, this dilaton direction, and the Kähler moduli at the same level. And it's a minor advantage of our construction, but anyway. Um, so I mean, you've got five more minutes. All right, that sounds good. That's all I need. So now we, I want to have some kind of more computer program approach to moduli stabilization. And for this, before we saw all these nasty exponentials that we had to deal with, so let's try to work with the self-duality condition instead. And what we did is we set up a three-step approximation scheme. At the first, we implement some kind of hierarchy among the moduli, which I'll make precise in a bit, where the extremization conditions are just polynomial. Then we take, at the next level, we take the scalar potential and we drop all the exponential corrections and keep everything else. Then scalar potential is not necessarily polynomial anymore, but it will be algebraic, by which I mean that square roots and these kinds of things can show up. And then at the next level, you could allow for all kinds of exponential corrections and take the fully corrected result. And now the upshot of this approach is that this first step, this level two approximation, is actually something that we've already written down in the Mathematica notebook. And you can just run it for any boundary given the data associated to it. We just insert the log monotony matrices and we get out what this approximation looks like. And from a practical perspective, you can now think of this SL2 approximation as the starting point for your numerics, where you have this complicated scalar potential, the SL2 approximation, and then the SL2 approximation fixes your uh, starting point from which you roll down using a numerical program or machine learning or whatever. And the upshot, another upshot of this approach is that this SL2 approximation is very, scales very well in the number of moduli. And it actually scales polynomially um, in complexity in the number of moduli that are there to compute it. It's just inverting matrices of size H21 by H21 and so on. So let's make this SL2 approximation a little bit more precise. Say we move to a strict asymptotic regime where we implement this hierarchy among the sections. And then what we know from this mathematical work on asymptotic Hodge theory is that there emerges an SL2 algebra for each of the moduli. And now what the theorem, um, the SL2 orbit theorem tells us is that we get a very simple behavior for this Hodge number. Now, why is this useful for us? Well, if you recall what the scalar potential looks like, it's G3 bar wedge star G3. So this SL2 orbit theorem predicts precisely how the scalar potential should look like in these asymptotic regimes. And it gives this form where you get some kind of power law in your sections, these blue coordinates, and then the exponents are fixed by the weights under the SL2 algebra. And now what I want to show you is that this is not just something mathematical that they say there exists such a basis, but we don't know how to compute it, but it's actually algorithmic and you can write it into a code. So let's look at an example. It's a little bit messy, but I, this is the simplest thing we can kind of get. So we go to this particular large complex structure point um, for this particular Gabriel manifold with intersection numbers equal to four and eight. And then we can either take this second approximation where we drop the Euler characteristic but take all the other terms, or we go to the SL2 approximation. And the nice thing, well, so naively you could think that you can just take each component of the matrix and do some kind of expansion, but the SL2 approximation is more refined and you should do something refined because when you're expanding a matrix, all these different components are correlated in how they act on the vector space. And for this, I wanted to single out these two particular terms or components where one term is subleading to the other in this particular limit. So now in this particular example, let's see if our approach actually made sense. So we considered a couple of different families where this hierarchy of the SL2 of this strict asymptotic regime is satisfied. And we actually see that the vacuum and the two approximations converge towards each other. And even better for us, um, we actually see that already when we put lambda equal to say a half, they are pretty close to each other. So this means that our approach makes sense and that for relatively small values on the hierarchies, 
you can already start running your numerics. So let me close up my talk. So what I hope if like the thoughts that you take away from this is why not go to another boundary moduli space, maybe use the asymptotic periods that we provided in our first paper, um, and actually maybe construct some interesting phenomenological models by using these essential corrections in the periods. And the other thought that I want to take you away today is that these asymptotic Hodge theory techniques can actually be something very practical in studying moduli stabilization. And now we only did really the first step properly in writing it into an algorithm, but maybe by using say machine learning techniques or something else, we can do the complete thing one day and stabilize all our moduli with a fully corrected potential. That's all, thanks. All right, let's thank Damien for the very nice talk. Um, is there any question? Okay. Uh, yeah, Liam? Hey, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, thanks. I, I had a question about, the, about this nice idea to, um, to get an exponentially small superpotential while, get, while, while keeping uh, order one masses. Um, uh -huh. Have you, so did, did I understand correctly that the idea is to, to set to zero the polynomial part of the superpotential but keep things that are metric essential? So yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we aim to do. We, yeah, we just took the extremization conditions. We just took the polynomial part first, and then we decided looked at like the largest, like what kind of conditions this imposes on the fluxes. And then only after achieving this, we stabilized like the remaining directions of these metric essential corrections. And, and and you did that explicitly. So you you found uh, choices of uh, flux vacua such that. There, is a, there are two competing metric essential um, terms that compete in a racetrack manner, or? Um, so you don't get a racetrack because um, these metric essential corrections always end up in the polynomial part of your scalar potential. That's like, yeah, the interesting comparison between the models that you, this, uh, you did and that we did. You can think of these metric essential corrections as um, your Konnefeld modulus. Your Konnefeld modulus from our perspective, like this z and z squared in our coordinates are e to the two pi i t and e to the four pi i t. Um, and these are actually already the metric essential corrections. And when you stabilize your Konnefeld modulus, it's stabilized by metric essential corrections. But when you actually compute your scalar potential for this modulus, you will see that it goes as log z or scalar potential. So just log z proportional to t from our perspective, something polynomial. So, 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 so you, you're saying there, there exists explicit um, vacuo with explicit fluxes such that um, W is exponentially small, but there's no small eigenvalue of the, of the Hessian. Um, yes, that's exactly that's what I'm saying. So this is what we engineered at this cyber Witten point and these during the generations. The only downside is that our methods are not um, really good at like saying whether the flux are in an integer basis or not. And this is something that we're currently looking into. Very nice. Thanks. Great. Uh, is there any other question? Ivana? Yes. Hi. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I would like to know uh, how easy is to compute the coefficients of these uh, essential exponential corrections in general? Um, so for me, it's something that I'm not good at. Um, but if you, because the problem is we know like our picard fuchs equations that we would use to compute it in an example. Um, but then you need to take your solution and analytically continue it to other boundaries. And this can be done, but it's a huge hassle with like um, determining like the transition matrices and all these things. And for like something like the Conifold, large complex structure boundaries there it has been done and you can check for instance um i think these two papers both for some results in these directions where they fix the coefficients but for other boundaries it's a little bit harder and often there are still a lot of numerical coefficients floating around 
So they depend on the specific case, I think. Yeah, Thank you. yeah we're now looking into this in more detail and there seems to be like a deep connections with modularity and L values, not worked out by us, but by other literature into this direction by like, um, say Albert Clem and these kind of people. But yeah, it's, it's heavy mathematics. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, before we move on, can I ask you a very quick question? Uh, so do, do you know, if the divines are in the moduli space that describes some 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 locus of the moduli space in which you can stabilize flux uh, complex structure moduli while having order one mass and but exponentially small domino let's say do you know if that locus has any intersection with the lcs locus if that is possible then do, do you know if there is an relatively easy way to use LCS data to go to the sum locus in the moduli space in which you can use those essential instant terms. So um, let me say two things here. So first of all, um, I recommend you to look at this second paper here because this is actually where like the cyber Witten point is studied and um, they consider all the boundaries in this moduli space. They also go to collisions of Konovold vacua and they get some kind of nice expressions for the periods. And the other paper that I want to refer you to is um, like the second paper on the distance conjecture by Thomas um, together with Chungchu and Eran Um, Because here they actually, you have this nice graph for this P11, I cannot see it myself now, 11226 in the moduli space and how all the divisors go. Um, and there you can actually see that like through some divisors, you can go from large complex structure to precisely what you want. Oh, great. That, that's amazing. Yeah, let me send it in the chat. That'd be great. Thanks.